It's um, 9.30, maybe we should get going. Um, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Father, as we come here on your day to talk about you and to learn about you, we ask that you will give us your Holy Spirit to open our minds, to increase our understanding, that we may see what you are really like. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, this is Lecture 10. My name is Mike Webster. And I'm today going to talk about the Sermon on the Mount and game theory. Now, that sounds like a fancy term, but let me explain that to you. Bob asked me to talk about Christian teachings and how they can be validated by science. In other words, is there scientific evidence that this way of life is the best, actually? Let's put it frankly. Now, before we go into that, I want to put this up because everybody's heard this saying this is and I'm going to show you the most profound question in the universe and if you put on your genome glasses you're gonna see that this has this is screaming genome at us and we just haven't been literal enough in the interpretation okay so now I'm gonna take you one of the wonderful things about computers is especially things like eSword, you can take a phrase and you can put it in the computer and it'll bring up every place that phrase is mentioned in the Bible. And if you've ever done that with certain concepts, it's magnificent because you go and read the text and it gives you just a little flavor on a concept in different circumstances. So what we're going to look at today is this, not this exact phrase, but son or children of God. Okay. So let's go through the Bible using this concept and see if this isn't screaming genome at us. But let's start with this interesting concept in Luke. This is describing the um, lineage of Mary. Okay? Matthews does the lineage of David all the way down. So here we go. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age being, as was, his, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli. And it goes on and on, and I, I jump to verse 38, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. Now why, I ask you, is Adam called the son of God? Everybody else is a son of a man, or the person before him, but why, is, why are they calling Adam a son of God? And it's mentioned somewhere else. When, Job, when God is taught, discussing with Job the creation of the foundation of the earth, he says, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So what is a son of God and what is a son of man? What's the, what, what is the Bible trying to tell us about this? Let's look at some other verses. And he said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet and I will speak with you. This is that surreal picture in the beginning of Ezekiel where he describes the throne of God and, and the wheels within wheels and the four-faced cherubim. And, and, it, and it, gets, it gets a little uh, unusual, but... In there, he's talking to Ezekiel, and he calls him a son of man. Okay? So Ezekiel is called a son of man. And Jesus himself calls him. Jesus calls himself the son of man. For the son of man is Lord of the Sabbath. So what I want you to get this concept in your mind is, what's the difference between son of God and son of man? Jesus answered them and said, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. So he's calling himself a Son of Man. But now notice here in Mark, at the beginning it says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So is he a Son of Man and is he a Son of God? Both. Exactly, he's both. So how does he get to be a Son of God and a Son of Man? Is it some nebulous thing that God says, okay, you're my sons. And why in the lineage of Mary do we see Adam called the son of 
God, but everybody else is a son of the person in front of them. It gets even more complicated. And this, I'm, it's lengthy, but I, you have to read it. Because this is screaming genome at us, okay? Everything we've talked about. You are, and let me just set the f scene here. Jesus is having a discussion, and I use that word in parentheses, with the leaders of the temple. And he says, you are doing the works, of your, you are doing the works your father did. And so they, they basically come with an underhanded insult here. They, say, they said to him, we're not born of sexual immorality, as, making a hint to his parentage. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God, and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my words. You are of your father, the devil. That's a pretty strong statement. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. Did you hear that? Your will, what you want to do, is to do whatever he wants you to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So Jesus is taking this another way. He's saying, you're under the control of your real father, and he's got you. Whatever he wants you to do, you do. There's no freedom for these guys. When he tickles a neuron, they behave the way he wants them to behave. So what is Christ and what are all these other texts telling us about son of? Leave it blank. So what I want to propose to you today, and let's just go one more. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. If you put your genome glasses on, what we've been talking about, what this uh, we believe is saying is that whoever makes your information system is your father. Adam's the son of God because God directly made his DNA and his system. We're the son of men because we get ours from our parents, right? So ours is handed down, so we're considered a son of man. Now, according to our genome idea about this, Jesus can be called the son of God because where did his Y chromosome come from? Directly. Holy Spirit made it. Where did his X chromosome come from? So he's both son of God and son of man, correct? All right. But notice that if you're led by the Spirit of God you're also considered the sons of God. Now, what's he telling you on that previous slide about the rulers of the temple when he's having that discussion? Who owns their DNA? The other side. And they control, he controls their thinking and what they're doing. They're already discussing killing him in that biblical verse just before that. But notice what John says here, 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, now we are sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. So evidently, there's still something to be completed. It isn't fully completed yet, correct? But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. So the final, the final tweak on this being, God being and making our genetics occurs just before he comes. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, we've all read descriptions of the second coming. One side is doing what? Fall on us, hide us from this. This is too uncomfortable to bear. And what's the other side saying? This is our, that's right. This is our father. We've waited for this. So something's happened to everybody's genetic makeup in this process. And Jesus, when he's talking to Nicodemus about the new birth, he's describing this to him. And he says, the spirit, you can only see the effect. You can't see what it's doing. You can't see it. 
You can only see the effect because it's occurring at the molecular level. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Once you've got his DNA makeup in you, you don't think about that behavior that the Ten Commandments talks about. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself. What is that telling you? When you consider, were the, on that biblical verse that I showed you when he called them, this, you are of your father the devil, were they keeping themselves? Were they in charge of, were they in self-control? No, they were puppets. Whatever, whoever, whatever the devil wanted them to do, all he had to do was tickle that neuron and they were off and doing whatever he wanted, right? So what this is telling us, if you're a son of God, you're in total self-control. And the wicked one touches him not. He's got nothing in you to hook or to pull or to fasten. When he redoes your DNA, you're totally free. For whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. And here's it is. For his seed remaineth in him. Whose seed? God's seed, right? Seed is always a word that we've said means genetic material. You are the seed of Adam. You are the seed of... Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin because God's DNA remains in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. Our original, before the hacking, default condition is we will love God supremely and never, ever think about harming our neighbor. Their well-being is our prime concern. We're done. That's the law. In a nutshell. So how do we get this? Spirit's already doing it. He said, whoever's led by the Spirit, you're the sons of God. The final tweaking hasn't quite been done. This overwhelmed John. For what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. I like the BBC because they have great science shows. Sometimes you catch some other documentary on there and the big hoopla in England is the royal family came to this. Or the royal family came to that. Do you see what I'm saying? That's, that's big. Whose royal family are we? If he's making your DNA and redoing it, whose royal family are you? Now, don't think that that entitles you to special treatment because remember, heaven works. They turn the pyramid upside down. You're now serving more people. Therefore, the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. So don't expect any privileges here. That's what he's saying. Now, before... I showed you a verse, I want to look at that word, verse meno, because it said, if his seed remains in you, and I parenthesize, that's the Greek word meno, I want to show you something about this word. The Greek word meno, okay, let's take a little look at that. How many of you, how many of you have read this text? But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. When you hear the word endure, what picture comes to your mind? Gritting of teeth? Right? You think of an endurance race. You're about ready to fall over dead, but you finally make it across the finish line, right? That's the picture I think of when I think of endure. So let's look at that word endure, okay? The actual word, and I've got the Greek Strong's number there, G5278. There's the Greek symbol right under the number. And what does it mean? Hupomeno. Well, we've seen meno. So what does hypo mean? Because there is no Y in the Greek. What is hypo? If you have a hypodermic, it means under, right? Under. Exactly. What does meno mean? To remain. So what is endure in the real clear meaning? What does it mean? To remain under. Now, does that text have a different meaning? 
But he that remains under unto the end, the same shall be saved. Does that give it just a slightly different flavor? Did Jesus use this analogy when he's absolutely racked with grief and he's looking at Israel? What does he say? How often did I want to what? Gather you under my wings like a hen gathers her chicks, right? And all Jesus is saying here, if you remain under, you'll be saved. That's a little different in my mind compared to endure. All right, I'm going to get back on track here because I had to show you that. Here we go. Today's lesson. Does the Christian life have benefits? Or are we giving up all for the kingdom? Is there any evidence for or against? So what we're going to do is we're going to look through several branches of science today and see what advantage this has, if any. Or is this a risky situation? We're just throwing the dice, hoping that this thing is right and that we'll get saved in the end. Or are there any advantages to what he's been teaching all along? When Bob assigned me this talk, I cringed. So he says, no, no, take the Sermon on the Mount and show them that this is the only way if you're even logical about life. So let's look. These are the verses that talk about this. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. Is that talking about the future or now? Well, it could be both. I'm not arguing with that. But it must, if it, to be life more abundantly, the only thing we know is right now, correct? So that, for that statement to be true, it has to count for now. Agreed? Well, he gets more clear in Luke. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house, or parents, or brethren, or wife, or children, for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time, and in the world to come, life everlasting. So he's putting a premium. He's saying, look, guys, even if there's nothing else, you've got to do this, just for your own well-being. Is that how you understand that? Let's look. So this is as told to the disciples. Not everybody. People that are following him. Okay? And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What does that mean? Luke takes it one step less. He says, blessed are the poor. But the poor, it, changes, it doesn't change the meaning. And I'll explain that in a second. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Have you ever thought about this? Jesus is saying when you're spiritually bankrupt, great. That doesn't make sense. When you're spiritually bankrupt, when you're spiritually on the, on the rocks, great. Am I reading the black and white correctly? Or in this case, the red and uh, blue? Do you see any other way around this? Is there another interpretation? I'm going to go through this lecture today and show you why this is absolutely essential. That when you feel you're spiritually bankrupt, now he can do something. Now you need the physician. Now your deadly genetic disease needs to be taken care of by him. This is step one. And after you realize you're spiritually bankrupt, you begin to mourn. And what happens to those that mourn? What are you mourning for? Something you don't have. But you're comforted. Blessed are the meek. How do you become meek 
after you recognize your spiritual bankruptcy and you mourn for it? How do you become meek? You realize there's nothing you can do about it, right? It's beyond your ability to do anything about. We'll go through this even more. Blessed are they who do hunger, which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for what? They shall be filled. Now who's doing the work? It's obviously not you. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Why does that come next? Because if you see, if you know your condition, how many times are you going to start finding the speck of dust in your neighbor's eye? It's none of your business. It's like, look, I got enough trouble here. You may be way more advanced than I am. Mercy. You see the steps this is taking us through? Blessed are the pure in heart. We don't realize it. But while this is taking place, we are getting cleaned up. We are becoming sons of God. He's taking care of our DNA. Does, does this make sense to you? For they shall see God. And finally, blessed are the peacemakers. All you want is just to take care of it. But don't expect that this will be understood here. Because what's going to happen? You're not going to fit in. This country and most other countries, self-sufficiency is prized. But I say unto you, it gets even tougher, guys. It gets even tougher. But I say unto you, not to resist an evil person. For whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn to him the other also. This is tough. And to the one desiring to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak also. Do we do this? Do we just roll over? And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to one asking you, and to the one desiring to borrow from you, do not turn away. This doesn't sound like sound financial advice to me. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and you shall hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who mistreat you and persecute you, so that you may prove to be the sons of your Father in heaven. Because he makes the sun rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. What is this telling you about the character of God? Do we do that? Okay, let's get to the meat of the matter. Is there any scientific evidence for this? Can we find anything that shows that this is the right way? Well, yes, we can. Let's go to something called game theory. This was invented by a mathematician called, his name was John von Neumann. It's been taken and tweaked by many other people, including, if you've ever seen It's a Beautiful Mind, Nash, okay? So this is a scenario where you set up a game that people play and you look at the mathematical outcome and you can prove statistically that this is what you should or shouldn't do. So now we're going to get an education in game theory. This is one of the simplest games. It's called the prisoner's dilemma. Okay. Player one, let's call him John. 
Player two, let's call him James. So James and John are caught by the police in a store. They don't have anything on them, but the police arrest them. They, the police, in searching the place, they find that the cash register's been rifled and something's missing. But they don't have money on them, so they can't prove it. So what do the cops do? They take them to the station and they say, separate these guys, we'll get a confession out of them yet. So what they do is they say to John and James, they say, here's the deal. If you keep quiet and don't say anything, you're, we can only get you for trespassing. That's one month in jail, minus one. Okay. However, if you rat the other guy out, we'll let you go. So if John, player one, rats out James, and James doesn't say anything, John goes free with the zero here. I'll put my pointer here. John goes free, and guess what James has to do? One year in jail, okay? Now, if they both confess, they get eight months. Is this making sense to you? You following me? So you've got two options if you're one person. You can either keep quiet, or you can rat or confess. And the official name for that is you defect from the cooperation, okay? So just let's look at this logically. If you're John, player one over here, what's your best option? What's the least risky thing you can do? Okay, if you keep your mouth shut, you might serve one. But what if the other guy rats you out? Then what do you have? Then you got a year in prison. Now, if, but if you confess, the best case scenario is you might go free or you might get eight months. This is a no-brainer, right? John's going to confess because those are his best options because he doesn't know what James is going to do. And that goes for James. And let me tell you, if you're robbing, there's no loyalty amongst thieves. So let's not think that we're going to all keep our mouths shut. So you see the dilemma? Now, if you play this game multiple times and tweak it a little bit, it tells you things. Two individuals acting in their own best interest pursue a course of action that does not result in the ideal outcome. Did you hear that? Pursuing your own interest, if you've got two people, does not result in your best outcome. The typical prisoner's dilemma is set up in such a way that both parties choose to protect themselves at the expense of the other one. If you rat them out, you get zero. Hey, if you both rat, guess what? Eight months. That's better than one year. As a result of following a purely logical thought process to help oneself, both participants find themselves in a worse state than if they had cooperated with each other in the decision making. So if they had both said, well, I'm not going to say a word because I, I wouldn't want to send John to jail, so I'm not going to say a word. And both of them felt that way, guess what? They'd do one month and they'd be gone. But because they don't think of the other person, what happens to them? Now, does this have any implications in life? why countries manufacture weapons. Let's look at Pakistan and India just as an example, okay? If India passes or decides not to make weapons, they'll make three trillion dollars or three billion dollars that year. They'll save that kind of money, okay? If Pakistan agrees to do it, they'll save three. However, if India builds and says, whoops, maybe we'll catch Pakistan off guard, India is going to come out way ahead in the next war, and Pakistan's going to lose. You see that? India, if they build and Pakistan doesn't, yeehaw, we're going to win the next war. If Pakistan builds and India passes, well, the Indians are in trouble. So what do they do? Can't trust those Pakistanis, and you can't trust those Indians. Let's build weapons. And they're worse off in the amount 
that they get to keep than if they had cooperated. Okay? Because the cooperation is going to save them three million or three billion or what dollars a year. That's why companies have price wars. If you're Pepsi and you want to raise the cost of your to get more profits, great. But what's your competition going to do? Are they going to raise theirs also? No. They're going to lower theirs because if they lower theirs when you raise yours, they're going to make more profit because they're going to sell more. They'll get your market share. And companies can't talk and say, we'll both raise our prices together. What's that? That's collusion. And boy, the federal government comes after you with that, buddy. So what do they do? They both lower their costs. And how's their profit margin down here in the corner in the green as opposed to if they both raised it? They make less money. They make nine million a year as opposed to 10 million if they both raised it. If two players play the prisoner's dilemma more than once in succession, here's what they do now, because we're going to tweak this a little bit. Let's play this prisoner's dilemma game multiple times. You remember the previous actions of your opponent, and you change your strategy a little bit. Okay, so let's look at a study. This paper appeared in 2008 in Nature. Winners don't punish. What did they do? They performed experiments in which each round of a repeated game, people chose between either cooperation, we've seen that, defection, and costly punishment. So I'm going to explain this game in a minute. In controlled experiments, so they wanted to see what would happen, they only gave them the option of cooperation or defection. That's the prisoner's dilemma. You can either cooperate or you can bow out. Okay? Here we show that the option of costly punishment increases the amount of cooperation, but not the average payoff to the group. Furthermore, there is a strong negative correlation between total payoff and the use of costly punishment. What that means is, and I'm going to read it to you in the last sentence, those people who gain the highest total payoff in this game tend not to use costly punishment. Winners don't punish in a game. Okay? This suggests that costly punishment behavior is maladaptive in cooperation games and might have evolved for other reasons. Let's look at the game and see what they're talking about. Most of our interactions are repeated and reputation is always at stake. Okay? So what they did was they took all these guys in the business department at Harvard and they put them in little cubicles and they said, here's your options. You're going to play against a number. You don't know who it is. So if it's that guy over there that's giving you this, the evil eye, the, you don't know it. All you know is you're playing against number five, number 22, number 30. It doesn't matter. And here's the deal. If you cooperate with them, it's going to cost you. You're going to have to pay something. You pay one unit out of your bank account, but your opponent gets two. So if you both cooperate, your net take is one, correct? Because you have to pay one. If he cooperates with you, you get two, but you've paid one, so your, your bank account goes up by one. Okay? If you defect, say, I don't want to play this game anymore. You get one unit, and he loses one. That's eh, pretty good. Suppose you want to spank him because you don't like his behavior. You pay one, he loses four. Okay? Now, you don't know who you're playing. We're going to put you in cubicles. Have at it. The winner comes out with the most money at the end or the most units. How do you think this turned out? I'm just going to show you a graph on what it looked like. If you cooperated, you ended up with one. If you both defected, you got zero. 
if you both punished at the same time, you lost five. And then those are the permutations in between, okay? How do you think it turned out? Was well, spanking good? Well, you know the title of this. So how did this finish? Here it is. These are the conclusions. These are the decisions people make. Nice people finish first. So if you cooperated, look at the final ranking. Number one and number two in the rankings finished first and second. All they did was cooperate. They played 1,230 wide paired games. Not just those two, but all of them together. And this is the summary that they came up with. Look at B up here. What does this say? Punish and perish. So here this guy, number 20, and he, I'll show you what he finished. Here's this guy right here. He decides to cooperate, okay? But this guy defects, so he's going to spank him. He's going to punish him. And he's, so what, is this, what does he do? He punishes, he punishes, and this guy says, I just don't want to play. I don't want to play. So he keeps punishing. Where did these guys finish at the end of the game? Out of 30 players, 25th and 22nd, just by defecting and punishing. Okay? Now, sometimes defection, I don't want to play with you anymore, restores cooperation. So here's this player here. Let me get my cursor back. And this guy defects, so he says, well, okay, I'm going to defect too. So they both defect, and finally he decides, oh, let's play. So they play, this guy defects, he keeps cooperating. Look who finished higher. See that? Cooperation pays. Turning the other cheek. Here it is. This guy says, yeah, defect all you want. I'm still going to cooperate. So he does all the way through. He finished sixth. The defector finished 19th. Mutually assured destruction. So they're playing along here. This guy says, this guy defects down here. This player says, I'm going to punish you for that. So this guy defects again. Then they both punish each other, and they both punish each other. And then he says, I'm not playing with you anymore. Where's he finished? Last. Revenge is not sweet. This is number F. So these guys are doing real well over here in F. They're cooperating, and then this guy defects. He punishes. He defects. They both defect. This guy's had enough. Right there, he just starts punishing all the way through. Where do they finish up? Way down at the bottom. And this one is a preemptive strike, okay? Everybody's cooperating, guess what happens? You punish, the defect, look at that. Second from the bottom, way down there. And that's called the option to publish. The, the option to punish allows irrational people to inflict harm on the undeserving. If you play this game enough, this is what everybody starts to learn because you remember number X did this to me. If you turn the other cheek and keep cooperating, what happens? You win, mathematically. These are their conclusions in the study. We conclude that costly punishment, there's coming at it from an evolutionary standpoint, and in this respect, maybe it was never written into the system. We conclude that costly punishment might have evolved for reasons other than promoting cooperation, such as coercing individuals into submission. Whose system is that? And establishing dominance hierarchies. Whose system is that? Costly punishment might force people to submit. You'll get down on your knee, all right, but not to cooperate. We have shown that in the framework of direct reciprocity, winners do not use costly punishment, whereas losers punish and perish. Now, let me ask you something. If this is written into the mathematical system that we live in, 
Is it possible God doesn't punish? And you'll have to wait for Bob's last lecture to get the answer to that. And it won't disappoint. That's called, I'm hooking you for his lecture. <laughs> Costly punishment is not a mechanism for the evolution of cooperation. If that's written into the mathematical fabric of our universe, people, then what is this telling you about God? If he's going to win, and mathematically we can show that winners don't punish, how's God going to win and get everybody to kneel and say you're right? Because he's not going to punish. What you do, you do to yourself, and everybody has to admit it. And that can only be explained from a genome standpoint. Either you turn down his gracious offer, or you let him clean you up. This was a commentary on the same paper in the, in the issue. The punisher pays. The tendency for humans to punish perceived freeloaders, even at a cost to themselves, is an evolutionary puzzle. Punishers perish. And those who benefit the most are those who have never punished at all. Although costly punishment induces cooperation, we're just reviewing some of the things, it costs destroy all gains from increased cooperation not just for the punished, but for the whole group. At the end of the game, those who punished were the ultimate losers. Are you seeing any spiritual insights into this? Absolute winners had never punished. They gave an example. Mahatma Gandhi is a prime example of the maxim that Dreber et al. establish in their social dilemma games. Those who do not punish come out on top in societal interactions. And then once again, they're saying that this punishment evolved for other purposes. What is this telling you? Are Jesus' sayings just smart and catchy, or are they written into the fabric, the mathematical fabric of our universe, and that's he behaves exactly what he's telling you to behave. It gets more interesting because they start talking about this in a book called The Wisdom of Crowds. It was re re written probably a nine, nine years ago, maybe six years ago. The argument for the development of cooperation through trust is given in The Wisdom of Crowds, where it is argued, listen to this, this is how important this concept is. It's argued that long distance capitalism was able to form around a nucleus of Quakers who always dealt honorably with their business partners. Rather than defecting or reneging on promises, a phenomenon that had discouraged long-term unenforceable overseas contracts. So you got a group of Quakers that are going to trade and say, yep, my word's good for something. You bring that boat, I'll pay you X. It is argued that dealings with reliable merchants allowed cooperation to spread to other traders. It's infectious. Once you start behaving trustworthy, everybody does. You end up being the winner. Spread to other traders who spread it further until a high degree of cooperation became a profitable strategy in commerce. It's good for you in this life too. All right, let's go to psychology. Are there any psychological advantages to the Christian life? Let's look at the word anxiety quickly. It's a state of uneasiness and apprehension, such as about future uncertainties. It's slightly different than fear. Fear is directed against a specific object. This is an anxiety about a general concept that you can't understand. It's, it's a form of fear, but fear is more directed. Fear is directed against a specific object. Anxiety is like that unease and angst that comes from something. Three types of anxiety in humans. This is identified by Paul Tillich. It was first done by the psychologist Karen Horney, and Tillich developed these ideas. Okay. So what are the three anxieties that human beings suffer psychologically? 
the anxiety of death or non-existence. As far as we know, we're the only people that know we're going to die. And that sits in the back of your craw all your life. It's unarguable. The anxiety of meaningless or emptiness. Peggy Lee, is that all there is? How many of you heard that song? I, mean, <laughs> I don't know why that came to mind. <laughs> anxiety of condemnation or guilt. That you're not living up to your potential. That you could have done more in your life. See these anxieties? Everybody has them. They're at the root of our very existence. We're going to answer some of these as we go through, but I'm just going to give you one quick question. What happens to these anxieties when you accept God's gracious offer? What happens to the anxiety of death? You believe it? It ain't over. You're just taking a nap. He calls it that. Are you meaningless? Hardly. Ambassadors for the court of heaven? You're kidding me. That's a pretty high title. What about condemnation or guilt? Where's that go? You're forgiven. So what instantly happens to those anxieties? In fact, it's used as an argument by the evolutionists. We were smart enough to develop religion so that we could take care of those things. Forgivenness. Not forgiveness. We're going to look at that. Okay? As we forgive our debts, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Notice the sequence here. What should we have done first? Okay. If ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. For if ye forgive not men their trespasses, whoops, this is tough, guys. What? Neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. This is a conditional statement according to what this says here. Am I reading it wrong? Any scientific evidence for this? Well, we can't answer for God. We just have to believe it, right? Let's see. Forgiveness by God, forgiveness by others, and psychological well-being in late life. Why is this important? Because whether we like it or not, there's a silver tsunami coming at this country. All of us baby boomers are getting there. This is becoming a huge deal because the wave of chronic diseases that is coming at this country. So they're looking at it. This came from the NIH, and this is important. The purpose of this study was to examine the relationships among forgiveness by God, forgiveness of others, and psychological well-being. First, the data suggests that forgiving others tends to enhance psychological well-being. Well, there's a new one. And these salubrious effects are greater than those associated with forgiveness by God. What was better than forgiveness by God? Forgiveness of other human beings, right? That's what this t study is showing. Second, the findings indicate that how older people go about forgiving others is important. Older adults who require transgressors to perform acts of contrition experience more psychological distress than those who forgave what? Unconditionally. This is tough medicine to swallow. No, you need to pay. I'm going to tell you men to try one thing and then don't, only, don't do it twice. Have you ever been wrong? I have. One time I tried this. I'm not going to tell you what happened when Bob tried it. <laughs> I was pointed out to me I was wrong, and I said, you're right, I'm wrong. She goes, no, you can't get away with it that easy. 
No, I said, I'm wrong. I can't be any more wrong than wrong. There's no super wrong. (laughs) And that didn't end the argument. I wasn't done yet. (laughs) Don't try that at home. (laughs) Third, the levels reveal that the forgiveness of God may be involved in this process because older people who feel they are forgiven by God are less likely to expect transgressors to perform acts of contrition. If you've been forgiven, you don't have to pay for that one. What do you think of that? Scientific literature, NIH, gets better. Unforgivenness, general concept, rumination and depressive symptoms among older adults from the Journal of Aging and Mental Health, 2010. Why is this important? Depression is one of the most common sources of emotional suffering within the aging population. Depression. Got a treatment for it. I'm just going to read the underlying part there. The results from a latent variable model indicate that unforgiveness by others has a significant direct effect on depressive symptoms and an indirect effect via self-unforgiveness and rumination. What's that saying? If you don't feel you're forgiven and you don't forgive, you're going to ruminate. What's the, you know what ruminate means? It's what cows do when they're sitting down. They just bring it up, regurgitate, bring it up, regurgitate, bring it up, regurgitate. Ruminate. I don't know about you guys, but I'm not liking the picture of my future. Sit there and regurgitate. However, rather than having a direct effect on depressive symptoms, unforgiveness by God, and if you don't feel forgiven, operates only indirectly through self-unforgiveness and rumination. So if you don't feel you're unforgiven by God, it might not cause that much, but it's going to cause you to ruminate. And when you ruminate, what's going to happen? Similarly, unforgiveness may have an indirect effect on depressive symptoms through rumination. It's the rumination that gets you in trouble. And this is how it works. Associated with unforgiveness or feeling unforgiven are feelings such as guilt, shame, embarrassment, and regret. For example, former soldiers have described the chronic guilt they have experienced associated with their inability to forgive themselves. Inability to forgive themselves for violent acts they committed during wartime. We ask a lot of our armed forces. Look at what they deal with. Why do we need them? If we all cooperated, we'd be fine. Our national debt would go to zero. This is what the article discovered as obstacles to self, forgiving yourself, because if you don't feel forgiven and you don't forgive yourself, you're going to ruminate, you're going to get depressed. Not forgiven by the people whom they have hurt. If you don't feel like you're forgiven by them, it's an obstacle for you forgiving yourself. It doesn't say it's insurmountable, it just says it's an obstacle. Belief that one is forgiven by God or a higher power. If you feel you're forgiven by God, it's easier to get over that obstacle and forgive yourself. And there's just some people are just unable to forgive themselves. So what this is saying, there's multiple sources for the feeling of unforgiveness, and these are associated with Symptoms of depression in the aged population, unforgiveness, and rumination are the mediators for this depression. While mulling over past events, those who ruminate tend to focus on their own failures. Guilt, worthlessness in life, the anxieties, psychological anxieties come in. The link between rumination and late life depression has only recently 
become a focus of researchers in geriatric mental health. Why? Because there's getting to be a lot of them now. So we find our findings reveal it is important to take multiple dimensions of unforgiveness into account when you're talking with people. Rumination plays an important role in the relationship between unforgiveness and depression. Feeling unforgiven by God was related to an inability to forgive oneself, leading to tendencies to ruminate. The recommendation, ask older clients if they're experiencing obsessive ruminations. What's love got to do with it? I'm going to make a recommendation, and I hardly ever do this, but this is one of the sermons I found to be one of the most profound and enjoyable sermons I've ever read. It's by Robert Wheeland. You can find it at this address on the web. 1888, a most precious message. Some of you know what we're talking about. Dot org. Go to the links, and it's two-thirds down the page. Christ's model Christian. Okay? This is how the sermon starts. I'm just going to paraphrase it. It's from him, but I think it speaks exactly to what we're saying. Okay? He gave us an example, but he didn't show us what and point to say that. That's what I need you to be. This is an example of what a prototype typical Christian is like. Okay? Businesses have them. New models. You go to the auto show, they show you the new models for the year. How come we need a Christian model? And Christ gave us one. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial for her, of her. This is a ringing endorsement. Wherever the gospel's told, this story has to be mentioned because of what she did. Agreed? Highest endorsement. Who's he talking about? A most unlikely candidate in our eyes. Right? Victim of sexual abuse. Fallen so low, her mind was inhabited by seven demons. Means she lost all self-control. Agreed? We've taken you through that. Backslid again and again. No biblical record of any others this low. There's nothing more she could do. How do we know that? She hath done what she could. He says it. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the bearing. When at last she began to grasp repentance, this is Whelan's words, when at last she began to grasp repentance in his behalf and could pray and forgive and pray for him, she was free. How she got there, I will never know. When she could finally forgive, she was free. One of the Pharisees asked him, let's read the story. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And going into the Pharisee's house, he reclined. Behold, a woman, a sinner in the city, knowing that he reclined in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster vial of ointment. And she stood behind him, weeping at his feet. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with her, the hair of her head. And she ardently kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. But seeing this, the Pharisee who had invited him spoke within himself. I mean, he didn't say it loud. 
He just thought it. This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what kind of woman this is who touches him. How did he know? He's the guy that did it. What kind of woman this is who touches him, for she is a sinner. Ouch. Please note carefully how Jesus deals with this sanctimonious Pharisee. Because right now, it's starting to well up. You want to spank him, don't you? What does the mathematical fabric of this universe say? How does Jesus deal with Simon? The one concept that the gospel gets through to us is that when it teaches us a lesson, it raises something higher to deliver all of us to. It brings us to a new goal. And those of us sitting here want to see, you know, we need our pound of flesh. You're not just wrong. Wait a minute, I'm not done with you. And answering, Jesus said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he said, teacher, speak. Jesus gives him a parable. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. You think Simon's starting to swallow a little bit? His mouth's getting a little dry. The one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And they having nothing to pay, he freely forgave them both. Which one of them would you say would love him most? And answering, Simon said, I suppose the one whom he forgave the most. And Jesus, and Jesus answering, and he said to him, you've judged correctly. And he turned to the woman and said to Simon, look at this. He turned to the woman, he's talking to Simon over his back. Do you see this woman? I entered into your house, yet you gave me no water for my feet. It's an insult in those cultures. She has washed my feet with tears, has wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss. But this woman, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with this ointment. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she has, what? Loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, what? He loves little. Now, in this scenario, when you see Simon and you realize who's behind the fall of this woman, who do you think is the greater sinner? Mary loved more, not because her sin was greater than Simon's, but because what? She felt it was greater. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. What does this say about us? I know your works. Laodicea, I know your works. You're neither hot nor cold. I would that you were hot or cold. Is that correct? He wants us to be one way or the other? That's what it says. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot or cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth. The original King James was spew. The word is emetico. Those of us that use anti-emetics at work know exactly what that word means. Don't make them nauseated and puke. Because you say, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And not, do not know that you're wretched and miserable, poor, poor and blind and naked. That's not a ringing endorsement. It's not too sad. It's not too bad yet. There's still some hope when we read this. I counsel you to buy from me gold purified by fire so that you may be rich. If you put the genome glasses on, what is the gold purified by fire? What did he go through? It's his microRNAs that are going to come in with under the Holy Spirit's influence and tie up that garbage in our genetics. 
get it from him. And white clothing so that you may be clothed. So that the shame of your nakedness, which has always been a symbolic representation of the state that people are in, sin. And anoint your eyes with eye salve so that you may see. Open your eyes, people. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Turn, turn around. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him. This is astounding to me when somebody pointed out, this is the only church he's outside knocking to get in. I will dine with him. What was the first beatitude? Do we recognize we're spiritually poor? Or are we rich and have need of nothing? I'm going to touch one other aspect on this. Treatment for addictions, 12 steps. Why? I'm going to make a couple statements here. Do you agree with this? Anybody? Is this, all addiction is sin, right? Well, I mean, if you're addicted to heroin, you're not certainly treating your body as the temple of God. It owns you. Agree it. We'll agree with that. Is that true? Is that last statement true? All sin is an addiction. Not sure? Let's look what the Bible says. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is what? A servant of sin. Is sin an addiction? That's what that's saying. If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. So if all addiction is sin, and all sin is an addiction, let's take a look at the 12 steps. Church basements are curious places. Playing host to a vibrant world of 12-step recovery, they witness the sort of healing and redemption that would make those on the ground floor proud and maybe envious. Ouch. Not many people know this. The 12 steps were derived from the Sermon on the Mount. Look at them one by one. We admitted, I'm taking these from AA. We were admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Are they recognizing their spiritual poverty and bankruptcy? Yes. Does this make sense? Came to believe that a power greater than ourselves would restore us to sanity. Where do you go? The physician. made a decision, this isn't going to be hard at this point, to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood Him. In other words, they're saying, we're not going to dictate to you what you understand God as. We're going to let you come to that agreement or understanding on your own with His help. We're not here to tell you what God is like. We're going to let you discover that on your own. That's more palatable for a lot of people. Look at the next one made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Ouch. What is this getting to the root of? They're starting to identify where you need to go to make, what? Admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. I'm going to tell God about it. I'm going to tell another human being about it. This is what is wrong with me after I do the searching. Now, six, we're entirely ready. I've underlined that because in their book it says this is what will separate the men from the boys. Because guess what? Most of you are not ready to have some of these defects of characters removed. Don't say never. Just say, make me ready. Now, apply that to a spiritual life and that's a big statement we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character 
Number seven, humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. Here we go, here we go. Made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them. Step nine, made direct amends to such people wherever possible except when to do so would injure them or others. And what they tell people is you have no right to go and tell your wife of all the 50 affairs you had just to unload your conscience. You can tell somebody else that isn't going to open their mouth, but that's going to harm her more than it's going to relieve you. So you're going to deal with that one. So that's what they're talking about with harming others. What are they getting at here, guys? If they're, and they'll tell them, they'll tell them, when you make amends, it does not matter what that other person does. That's not your problem. You've gone and attempted to say, I was wrong in what I did. If there's any restitution I can make, here it is. What have you done? You've cleaned your side of the street, right? What that other person does is irrelevant. You've attempted to clean up your side of the street. They'll also tell you one other thing. Whose name do you put at the top of the amends list? Yourself. You put your name first because you've done more damage to you than anybody else. Continued to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. Sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him. Praying only for the what? Praying only for the knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. Wow. My prayers don't. I'm, I've got a list sometimes. Having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, what did we do? We tried to carry this message to other alcoholics, practice these principles in all our affairs. Halfway between those promises, I mean, between those steps, there's something known as the promises. It's not labeled as promises, but that's what they call it. And you've got to read this, because this is amazing. They're saying, if we're painstaking about this phase of our development, we will be amazed before we are halfway through. We're going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. So things are getting better. We will not regret the past, nor wish to shut the door on it. You have got to be kidding me. If you're an emotional, financial tornado ripping through people's lives, you're not going to want to forget it. That's what it says. We will not regret the past, nor wish to shut the door on it. We've made amends for it. We will comprehend the word serenity, and we will know peace. I'm just going to add one thing there. One of the guys told a story about the first time he felt serenity. He was driving somewhere with his wife, and he says, you know what, dear, I think I've suffered brain damage from all that drinking. She goes, why is that? She goes, I don't know, it's just quiet. I don't have that nya, 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 nya going on in my mind. This is a per how do you describe serenity to somebody whose mind is going off like that? He thinks he suffered brain damage. That's hysterical. We will know peace. No matter how far down the scale we have gone, we will see how our experience can benefit others. The feeling of uselessness and self-pity, well, there's one of the anxieties again, will disappear. We will lose interest in selfish things, gain interest in our fellows. Self-seeking will slip away. Our whole attitude and outlook on life will change. Fear of people and economic insecurity will leave us. We will intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle us. And here's the kicker. What do they suddenly come to the realization of? We will suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. That's huge. Then they go on to say, are these extravagant promises? We think not. They're being fulfilled among us, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. They'll always materialize if we do our work. And that's outlined in the steps. I've always, always loved this show. But it's ir ironic to me, and I don't think many people have got this irony. Here's the song. 
that introduces cheers, right? Making your way in the world today takes everything you've got. Taking a break from all your worries sure would help a lot. Wouldn't you like to get away? Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name. And they're always glad you came. You want to be where you can see troubles are all the same. You want to go where everybody knows your name. These Alkies are getting us in the bar. Guess what happens when they go to AA? Same thing. Troubles are all the same. Everybody knows their name. God must love Alkies. They're getting it on one end, beats them up, they get it on the way out, getting better. Doesn't this sound attractive? You just lay it down for a little bit. That should be the atmosphere here. We've all got spiritual disease. We've all got genetic disease. We're all in a battle. Aren't you glad just to see the people sitting next to you? Always glad you came. Troubles are all the same. We're all fighting the same thing. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this day, for the day you've set aside for us to sit and talk about you. We thank you for what you've shown us about your character and how you treat us. Please be with us in the coming week. We ask your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all.